They would roam the coast. Aren't you getting the big snack at Turtles? Enforcing the embargo. He's trying to trade whiskey called Superfine to an English ship. Wouldn't it have been awesome to be at the time where there were massive snapping turtles? Who in here has had snapping turtle? No, I don't <laughs> Am I the only one who was forced to live an entire year on nothing but snapping turtle? I own a turtle. Boil it. <laughs> <laughs> don't boil your turtle. I like it. <laughs> no, I actually had snappy turtles. Yeah, I was like five or six years old, and I had an aunt who was kind of crazy. And I remember being in her house, we're in Nebraska, and she goes, "This turtle stew," and I'm like, "No, I mean, no way!" And my mom, I remember. Just, you know, that's what, I have no idea what it tastes, and I have that turtle in in France. Too. And horse, and rabbit, squid. <laughs> I like turtles. So don't boil your turtle. <laughs> really so these massive turtles would enforce it, and they're trying to get the license, but no, because the turtle has a it out in this. Oh, this curse it! Oh, grab me! So grab me! Would roam the coastline. That's my vision of the turtle. It's not really you see it? You get it? Oh, grab me. Do you see it? What is it? Embargo. Embargo backwards. That's why the snapping turtle. That was the attack on it. So they're they're mocking that you we can't even criticize it or we lose our business. So we're not gonna say it, we'll say oh grab. They really did that. <laughs> I'm keeping that. I know we're being recorded, but I'm whispering that. So, with that, Jefferson and his embargo was a failure. He could not run for re-election. He kind of wanted to, but couldn't. And he kind of confirmed this precedent of only two terms. And what happened is Madison would be elected. And Madison was a Republican. He was a Secretary of State, another Virginian. And we have the Madison administration. And the Madison administration is going to have to deal with this commercial war and other wars, too. And there's John Madison and his wife, Dolly Madison. And much like Abigail Adams, she very intelligent, but like what women had to do, it had to be behind the scenes, but a great influence on her husband. This was a different era. We'll talk more about that in a couple weeks. But Madison, the first thing they did is they <coughs> decapitated the old gravity. That is one gruesome <laughs> cartoon. Don't do that. <laughs> and if a snappy turtle does have a hold of you and you cut its head off, it grips harder. The jaws lock. That's what happened to your finger, right? <laughs> no, you lie. <laughs> and what's that? Which one looks like a really hard fight for the guy because he's on top of it and like struggling. Or something. Well, it's not easy. I mean, look how big that over is. How do you get turtle on his back? How do you get rolled and flip it? <laughs> right? Just shove a one side. Yeah. That's where snapper turtles live. So, it's a cartoon. Don't think too much about it. <laughs> so, they tried a number of laws that it deal with this commercial war. Because they're still stopping ships, they're still impressing sailors. And that's Napoleon crossing the Alps. His horse actually did that just on its back legs. Mm -hmm. I would not recommend that. I love all the, the propaganda Napoleon paintings. That's kind of a famous one. That's like, it's blown apart by David. The first attempt was called the Non-Intercourse Act. Intercourse in this context means trade. And what it was, we won't trade with any belligerent. No one fighting in the war will trade with. The problem was, that's who we wanted to trade with. So this law, failure. I mean, they knew it right away. This law is going nowhere. So another law was passed with the very clever name, Macon's Bill Number 2. Now, Macon's Bill Number 2 is significantly different than Macon's Bill Number 1. That's all we need to say. No, this is a stupid bill. It's one of those that, like, kind of sounds good to people who don't think. It said, the U.S. will trade 
with whomever respects our neutrality. We'll trade with whomever respects our new neutrality. So if the British get rid of their orders in council, we'll, we'll trade with Britain. Or vice versa. Yes? What was um, the non intercourse we, We'll trade with nobody who's at war. No belligerent. The problem is, that's what we want to trade with. Now, it's one of those bills, see, we'll, we will support whomever respects our neutrality rights. Really? Because if we embargo one country, we're essentially entering the war. This is the kind of bill that could really be dangerous, and it would be. Now, it's going to take into 1811. You know, things took a lot, of time, a lot of time. We basically sent these to both Britain and France. And France, they responded by their for new foreign minister, Talleyrand's Ad, who'll come back, the Cadore letter. And the Cadore letter basically said that France will respect our rights. It didn't really say how. But it said they would, and we believe it. Because the Republicans were more pro-French. The problem was they were lying. The French were not going to change the continental system at all. But in 1811, at the end of the year, the U.S. embargo break. So we've essentially entered the war. Arguably, that's an act of war. Then. And so the United States has now entered it. Britain actually did not want, even though the U.S. was weak, did not want a war because they were fighting the French. And so this was a disastrous move. Disastrous. But while this is going on, the exact same time, battles in the Northwest. North, we call them Northwest Indian Wars. I think Northwest, remember that's Indiana at this time. Ohio, Indiana, Michigan. And these are things we've mentioned before. I've mentioned the Battle of Fallen Timbers, but the big ones at Treaty of Greenville back in 1794. This is a watercolor of fallen timbers. It probably looked nothing at all like this, but it's a contemporary one, so I showed it to you. Yeah. 1794. And just to review really quickly, the Treaty of Greenville, all that area in blue was given, or purplish, I guess it's more purple, isn't it? This was given to the United States. The rest of this area was going to go to the various tribes for how long? Forever. Yeah, forever. Which, of course, the United States violated very quickly. And they would sign a whole series of other unequal treaties. So these big hunks of land at the end of the year, the U.S. would sign a treaty. And what they would do is they would just find some man they could claim was a chief, usually give him a bunch of goods and whiskey, was he a rum. And he put an X on the treaty, and the U.S. would say they had the land. And these were terribly unequal. But the tribes were fighting each other. But at the end of the Ox, so 1808 to 1809, a new group was forming in what is now, well, it was Indiana Territory then. And this would be, in reality, the last chance for American Indians to stop the expansion of the United States, at least hold something. And it's going to be a confederacy. Well, actually, it's going to lead to a big battle. So let's get the battle Tippy Canoe. Tippy Canoe. All the timbers typically do in Horseshoe Bay are like the three biggies. Typically, it's the most important battle between the United States and American Indians. And this Confederacy, okay, I've talked about this before how the tribes had a much more complex hierarchy of men and women. But it does seem that Tecumseh was uniquely talented, even though the United States always did pick a man. Tecumseh was very pragmatic. He was a Shawnee, and he realized that the only way. The only way to stop the U.S. is to unify. Quit fighting each other. But the other thing was this, not just that. Quit buying your stuff. Quit being dependent upon goods from the U.S. Like clothing, food, weapons, and whiskey, and rum. That was really corrosive. Remember we talked about the fur trade? And how they would basically start trading for just fur and get them to be dependent upon goods. This happened in Massachusetts. Tecumseh realized this, and Tecumseh is going to become a real threat to the expansion of the United States by 1810. He was rallying tribes, he traveled throughout the Northwest, and he had help. Well, before we get to that, Tecumseh was going to be seen as somebody who was, in the United States, very talented, very smart, respected, very much respected. 
So this is it. This, uh, this picture of him was done in the 1840s. And remember, well, think about it. The country's pretty racist. They look at somebody they respect. How'd they draw? You notice he has European features? They look at it as, well, if he's going to be respected, he must have had European blood. What a way for racism to work. You'll see that a lot of times. So we try to draw, like, especially like African Americans, will make them lighter skin. So he's, well, he must have European blood. So racism is corrosive that way. Tecumseh, here's a more contemporary picture of Tecumseh, right here. Kind of like this one, and they went back and colored it, but that's obviously more accurate. A couple funny things. First off, his hair was not blue. <laughs> but the other thing was he liked wearing British military uniforms. And for some reason, I just think that's really funny. <laughs> I don't know why. And why not? He could wear whatever he wanted. He was talented. But he had the help of his brother. And his brother, okay, English speakers had trouble with his name. Here it is, phonetically spelled. Anybody want to give it a try? Do you want me to do it? The prophet. <laughs> English speakers could not do it, so they called him the prophet. He was more of a religious leader, so we have to come up very pragmatic political reasons, how to stop the United States unified, start making your own materials, especially bow and arrows, and here a religious aspect that he comes and speaks for the gods. And he seemed to speak for the gods because he did something that just blew people away. He predicted that the sun would disappear. <laughs> the gods would bring it back as a symbol to follow him. What did he predict? How did he do that? Probably <laughs> saw He probably picked a bunch of math at the jail. After he saw it one time, he figured out where he was going to go. Or cheat. Yeah. Uh, how would he cheat? A bunch of leaders of the tribes of the Northwest. The United States brought them to Philadelphia in the early, like the odds. So like 1801, 1802. With the idea being this. Let's show off how powerful the United States is. Philadelphia was a scientific capital. Show all the wonders of this new society. Basically saying, you don't want to resist this. Look how you want to be part of us. And then he was given an almanac that had the date of an eclipse. It was seven years later, but he just waited. And waited. And waited and predicted. Hmm? What's that? He made me jump. Has anyone seen any clips? Where? A full one? We haven't had one here. Oh, wait, I saw one. Where? We haven't had a full one. In a long time. It's close. I don't think it's going to be right here. Not place. here, if you tell us more. Where did you see one? I didn't see one like, in person, but there was like, a live like, one. You made this one. Oh, I remember that one, yeah. <laughs> I remember when it went across Montana in like, 76. So I went and saw it. That was pretty cool. The sun disappeared. It was, I still vividly remember that. But also terrified of not looking into the sun. I said, you go blind immediately! Never forget that. And then I said, sun emerged and it all came back and people followed me for years. <laughs> well, the thing is, once you make a great big prophecy like that, sure, you have credibility, but now what do the people want? More! Tell us more! And he started making more and more outlandish prophecies. So by 1811, he's basically saying that you follow me and you'll become bulletproof, you'll take off, you know, all your family members will come back. I mean, all this stuff. The bulletproof one might be problematic. Well, Tecumseh was, you know, he knew his brother was a little bit outlandish. Oh, by the way, there's a lot of one-eyed American Indians. Europeans really noticed that. You want to know why? They practiced bow and arrow against Yeah, it was like a lot. Lost an eye. Don't do that. So if you're out there hunting turtle. <laughs> Is that what you did? Were you hunting? What kind of turtle? But we're going to watch William Henry Harrison. William Henry Harrison was the military governor 
of Indiana Territory, a patrician from a very wealthy Virginia family, and he. And I'm sorry. Thing is, though, it's amazing how fast your left hand will write your right well. It's amazing. What a try. He was a military, well, he was the governor of Indiana Territory, but he was also a military leader. And a very wealthy man from a very wealthy family, very ambitious. And he knew that the council was a real threat. But he had one big thing going into the fall of 1811. Tecumseh had gone south, basically to like Alabama, well, Mississippi Territory, now Alabama, Tennessee. He was going to get the powerful tribes in the southwest, specifically the Creek, hoping they would join his confederacy. And if he could get those southern tribes, that would have been a game changer. We would have, things would have changed dramatically. They could have held together. Still would have been iffy, but while he's gone, that's when Harrison decided to move. And here is Vincent. There's a four called Knox here, not the same one as in Kentucky today. But here is a place that the um, they dubbed Prophetstown, where all the followers of the prophet were. And there were thousands of them. Was, these were the most radical. From all these tribes who just really believed the prophet would make them bulletproof and they could win any battle. So Harrison marched a small force of a couple thousand men. Most were militia, but they had the one really important thing, cannon. With grape shot. The grape shot. That is the big. That's the big. He marched up here and in November across Tippy Tippy Canoe Creek from Prophetstown. They dug trenches and sat there. And Eric, for a couple days, just some Prophetstown. They're just going nuts. All these young men said, let us attack, let us attack, let us attack. Even though Tecumseh said, don't do anything stupid, he couldn't control his men. And on November 7th, 1811, they attacked. And this was a chaotic battle called Tippy Canoe. And it raged back and forth. There's another contemporary watercolor. It tries to show like this uh, heroic bayonet charge by the United States Army. It wasn't like that. They were in trenches in these human wave attacks. Well, thought the bullets would bounce off of them. And the battle was touch and go, but grape shot was decisive in breaking up these attacks. And at the end of the day, a U.S. victory. The United States won. Yeah. What day it? It's November 7th, but it's launched in 1811. This is supposed to be the prophet right here. And this defeat was, in the long run, one of the most decisive American U.S. victories in, in history. Victories of the United States. It wasn't like this big victory on the battlefield, but it changed everything. Because, three big reasons, I'll tell you them really quick. Number one, reason number one, it ended the Confederacy. Tecumseh's Confederacy fell apart. The Southern tribes would not join. He had to flee to Canada. And that was it. That was the last chance. American Indians had to stop the expansion of the United States. After Tippecanoe, there's absolutely no chance. So that every battle, every fight, every desperate struggle for them to keep their land, it's going to be a doomed effort. I know we got the advantage of hindsight, and they didn't realize that right away. Heck, Montana's had, Montana in the state, probably the most, or really close to the most famous battle between the United States and American Indians. What battle? A little bit on and it was a victory by the Lakota and mostly Lakota and Cheyenne over the U.S. Army, but it was part of a tragic and inevitable last stand. It didn't mean it had to happen, but looking back in hindsight, the United States is going to take this land. And once the Industrial Revolution happens, they're going to do it in a shockingly brutal way. Absolutely shocking. Tippecanoe was the last chance. It's due nothing. Two, citizens of the United States totally changed how they thought of themselves. And this is hard for me to do because I'm so ingrained of saying something. I've tried not to, and I said it a couple times here, and didn't mean to. In 1800, somebody would have said, hey, look, pointed at some people and said, 
Look at those Americans. People would have thought you meant American Indians. Citizens of the U.S. refer to themselves as you know, Virginians or New Yorkers or whatever. Occasionally you might see written as Americans generically for people who lived here, but people didn't refer to themselves as that. After this battle, in the years that followed, attitudes changed. Citizens of the United States started saying, we are the legitimate owners of this continent. We are the Americans. We. And think about that for a second. What's that saying is that somehow we have the destiny to own this continent. Somehow that we're special. And the people who did live here, no, they're not special. And that's where you're going to see this overnight more and more. They're a bunch of savages. Who didn't deserve it. Remember how I told you how American Indians people look at it as liberty, meaning kind of symbolizing liberty? The years after Tippecanoe, that had to a goal. And even people who would supposedly like defend American Indians, they would call them noble savages, implying, well, at least they fought a noble fight, but they're still savages and deserve to be civilized. And that's a real big change. And think about that for a second. Really think about it. Citizens of the United States were the Americans, our continent. Canadians don't say that. Mexicans don't say that. Brazilians don't say that. Citizens of the United States claim this continent for ourselves. And I'm so ingrained in, you're so ingrained out saying we're Americans. But think about that for a second. Then if you go to another country in the Americas and say that, I mean, you're saying you're not really legitimate? And I had a guy in Costa Rica tell me that. He said, God, you people in the United States are so funny that you say that. He said, yeah, I guess that is pretty funny. Yeah. You should call yourself Americans. Because, no, I don't want people to think I'm from the U.S. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? I thought that was pretty, he laughed. He, he was a really nice guy. But I am i wasn't conscious of it the first time I went to Canada. And I thought someone in Canada told me, you Americans do. But the one in Costa Rica really, that guy really, I don't know, it really got to me. But what, I mean, that's really arrogant. But we all do it, right? Because we're special. But why are we special? Well, we shot grave shot in these guys' faces. Why? I mean, let's, let's get to the reality of it. So it's always more complex than that. No, I'm not saying you shouldn't call yourself Americans. But it is something to think about, the implications of that. And three, who did we blame for Tecumseh? The British. We said the British were arming them. In fact, we people made the argument that they never would have tried to unify if not for the British. Like somehow the British also made them realize how badly they've been treated. You'll see the same thing about, like, for example, uh, African Americans fighting for equal rights in the 1960s. Oh, it's a bunch of agitators from the North. No. They knew all the situation. The same thing people said about women demanding equal, equal rights. Women were perfectly fine not being equal citizens, right? And then some people agitated them. Like women could not have figured that out for themselves. <laughs> it's true. I mean, that's a very common thing that whoever's in charge does. But out of this, that the British have got to be stopped. That more than any other single reason, including the trade thing, would be the cause of the war of 1812. Which, of course, most of it would be fought in 1813, 1814. And the biggest battle of the war would be two weeks after the war ended. Yes? So they started war because they fought. Uh, was being helped by the British. Okay. And the idea was we got to knock the British out of here or there'll be continuous problems on the frontier. Because as I told you how this battle would be so crucial, they didn't realize it immediately. Heck, William Henry Harrison, though, when he went for president in 1840, his nickname was Old Ted. That was 29 years ago. And his campaign slogan was Tippy Canoe and Tyler too. John Tyler was his vice presidential candidate. In 1840, just Tippy Canoe meant something. It's a big deal. But the, the it sounds comical, Tippy Canoe. So I think people didn't, you know, they it just kind of lost its importance. Well, at the same time, all this is happening. 1810, a group of Republicans were elected, mostly Western and Southerners, and they got the name the Warhawks. Grundy was one. You don't need to know Grundy. The one you need to know is Henry Clay and the other guy. Henry Clay is going to become one of the most influential politicians of the first half of the century. Of that century. 
And they're called war hawks because they wanted to go to war against the British. They wanted to get that land in the West, to get rid of the British, opens up the frontier. And the term hawk is going to become meaning pro-war. So by the time you get to the Vietnam War, you're going to have hawks or pro-war. What's anti-war? Doves. Yeah, doves. And this guy. And that guy would also be from South Carolina. So, you know who that is? Nobody knows? Is that picture up? <laughs> Man, sorry. We don't know who that is? Hmm? That's a picture of him in the 1840s. There were no photography then. And that is uh, John C. Calhoun. Calhoun, right there. And look at that finger. <laughs> now he's going to be uh, the most horrible man ever to live. And look at that picture. Okay. <laughs> look, look, no, wait. This is, real, this is photography. Look, everybody in the room, look at his eyes. No matter where you're at in this room, he's staring. He's staring right at you, right? But he's not looking at you. What is he doing? He's staring into your soul. Exactly. Right into your soul. He's, why is he just that much smiling or horrifying? Yeah. What is that? 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 A turtle. A, a turtle. <laughs> That's Calhoun, the most horrible man ever to live. Oh yeah, we'll come out to Calhoun. He will be a he was a Republican from South Carolina. Then he would become a Democrat. Then he'd become a Whig. Then he'd become a Democrat. Then he'd be no party. I think he's still alive. He's a hero in parts of the South. We got a submarine named after him. And he's arguably the most horrible man ever to live in the U.S. But not arguably, they're actually worse. They pushed Madison for war, and after Tippecanoe, they got Madison to finally ask for a declaration of war. You don't need to know the exact date, I put that up there, but 1812, and you don't need to know the vote. I just put it up there to give you an idea how close it was to the Senate. But one thing you do have to get down, northeastern states voted against it. Northeastern states, and the war is going to be really unpopular in the northeast. And those war hawks pushed and pushed and prodded them to war. And there are three big reasons. The first one is neutrality rights. That whole Cadora letter, Macon's Bill Number Two, dealt with that. But in reality, the area that was most impact, impacted by it, the Northeast, was against the war. This was not the most important reason for war. Security along the frontier, Tecumseh might happen again. We need to get rid of the British. But the last one, Canada. These are plantation owners. Remember, we're, all, we're obsessed by land. During the Revolutionary War, in fact, before the U.S. even declared independence, the United the colonies tried to invade Canada. Assuming they joined, failed. But then we thought we take Canada, all this land, and so that is basically the best battle put in Bay. A watercolor. I just like it with the sword, but. The United States was incredibly unprepared for war. But, oh, let me, you don't, don't write everything down. I put down a bunch of things down. Let me tell you what you need to know. We do need this. Opponents are going to dub it Mr. Madison's War. And the, the two things you have to get down is there's no Federalist support, especially in the Northeast, New England. And also put down that the Bank of the U.S. Charter. The Bank of the U.S. Charter expired, and we didn't put another bank in the United States. Remember, Republicans were against it. The problem is, when this expired, the financial situation of the country broke down. Those are the two things you need. Then the rest of it, I just put up there to give you an idea how bad things were. Our army was tiny. It would get up to 35,000, but some places didn't even send their militia. We only had seven ships that were ready for fighting, 16 total, but they, most of them couldn't fight. The British had 200 ships at the line. We had none, and over a thousand other ships. The Royal Navy was 
awesome, strength-wise. Well, crazy. Yeah. How can the Lord Almighty come aboard some guys? Not the British out. They wanted the land. Oh yeah. Sometimes they don't really think of it that way. They actually really did assume that Canadians would all rise up and overthrow the British government. Because it's a British colony. Actually, the Canadians fought really well. I thought Canada was French. Well, they were French Canadians, but now it had become a British colony, remember, after the Treaty of Paris, the 1763. And so a lot, a lot of British settlers are coming in now. And so the point is, we were totally unprepared for war. It was crazy to go to war, but we did it anyways. In the short run, it helped Madison. He won re-election. But look at the northeastern states. Now, the plan was, everyone knows the plan, right? Invade Canada, correct? Invade Canada, go join us. So it's a three-pronged invasion of Canada. Lake Champlain, same place where, remember, Saratoga and all that. Niagara, which is pre near present-day Buffalo, and Detroit. Anybody want to guess the outcomes? Terrible failure, humiliating failure, disaster. Absolute disaster. I can't even begin to describe to you how bad Detroit was. And in the Battle of Niagara, the New York militia refused to join the fight, and they watched the American army get defeated from hillsides. That gives you an idea how divided the country was. Just a disaster. How much time do we have left? Oh, shoot. Okay, so. One battle we do need to know. We'll get to it right now. The Battle of the Thames. And this would be one of the few American victories. But we're saying this because Harrison, same guy, would lead kind of a raid into Canada. And at the Thames, they finally defeated the last of Tecumseh's Confederacy. And Tecumseh would die here. But it still is not a major victory. The only thing that saved the United States is that Britain was dealing with France. And they had these titanic struggles across Europe in 1813. But in 1814, the British are coming back. They're going to do a... All right. Fortunately, just write down last thing. And I'll tell you about those last things. But we need the Treaty of Ghent. Both sides just wanted out of this thing. So the Treaty of Ghent ended the war. And it's called a Status Quo Antebellum Treaty. James, you already know this? Uh, no. Oh. We better get it down. I know you're, you're very intelligent about it. Status quo means the way it was before the war. Antebellum means before the war. So it's like the war never happened. So we lost in reality up to the treaty, but we just got out of this thing. Ironically, the biggest battle of the war is going to take place two weeks after the war ended in New Orleans. I'll finish with a couple of little things on Monday, but we got to this, so we're set up for the test. Next week. Well, maybe tomorrow. Wednesday. Thursday, I can tell you a couple of stories before you do it. Why not? Wait, what did you say? Thursday? Yeah. I'm going to be here Thursday. I don't think people. Wednesday. What did you say? Hmm? What did you say? It, the, the, actually, the biggest battle of the war would take place two weeks after the war. No, I meant like, what are you going to tell someone to do? Uh, on Monday or, or next Wednesday, or, or Monday or this upcoming Wednesday, I'll just tell you a couple of stories because I didn't quite get you. I was a little behind in your class, for which I blame you, Anna. Okay. What was wrong with my essay? Because I didn't know anything I would do that badly. Well, here's the thing. I don't mind telling you, and I do want to talk to you about your essay. But why didn't you come talk to me right after I handed it out when I said, come talk to me? Uh, Those of you did not. Because I figured I had to talk to you. Oh, you spirit. So